You know, I've learned to manage it because today I have tools that I didn't have then. You know, and and you know, and I'm one of those guys today. I can sit here and I can tell you there are people in this room this very moment that know everything about me that I have no secrets from. But I can say here I am. Here is absolutely the good, the bad, the ugly. And I knew everything about them. And it's because we made a, a, an, an honored commitment to show up and just be ourselves. And, you know, my mom died in August of 2002. And shortly thereafter, I went to a brief recovery workshop over in L.A. or Sherman Oaks or somewhere. And, and it was a it was a great experience, and and, and one of the, the, the tools or uh, one of the exercises they they had us do is that we created this timeline, and I remember drawing this timeline on a, a chalkboard, and and then you know on the left side of that timeline I had to put down what is my earliest recollection, my earliest memory, you know, up until the present time. And, and anything above the timeline was you perceived that or you deemed that to be positive. And anything below that timeline was negative. It was the age of 15 before anything appeared above the line. Age of 15. And so as I was thinking about this, whatever I was going to talk about tonight. Um, that moment coincided with the fact that, um, you know, I was in a leadership position at the Betty Ford Center. Uh, one of my closest friends to this day uh, is a woman by the name of Lori Scotchel. And, and Lori was my executive assistant. <clears throat> And, and um, we had a wonderful professional relationship and we were good friends. And she came to me, and some of you have heard me say this, she came to me one day and she said, Mike, I don't know what's going on with you, but, but you're making me crazy and you're making a lot of other people crazy. <laughs> and you know, um, I started to look at that. And um, it, it made sense because it's true. You know, when it's true, when it's true and you know it's true, it's hard to deny it, you know. And, you know, uh, the, the, my emotions were really just negative and things looked ugly and I didn't, you know, you know, I worked at this beautiful campus with wonderful people and I'm thinking, man, what, what's really going on with me? And I had been sober about 25 years at the time. I was given the gift of sobriety as a relatively young man. I got sober when I was 26. I'm just about a month shy of being 65, you know. And and but I started to look at that, and um, and I started to talk to other people, men in this industry that I respected, and and and, and I and I think there might have been some other conversations going on. Michael Walsh and Dirk and Miles and Mike Early and my Armstrong and Gary Fisher and people we know, people that really uh, understand this business. But I said to some of these guys, this is how I'm feeling. Do you ever feel like this? Well, how to a person we felt like this. And so we collectively said, well, we're, you know, let's pool some money and resources and and we'll hire a facilitator and we'll begin to drill down into the causes and conditions and, and look at this. You know, I, I think honestly at that time my, my marriage is, is certainly not what it is now. My wife and I were separated. Um, my oldest daughter was living with me. My twins were with my wife. There was just a lot of chaos. And frankly, I felt really ineffective at work. But I sure as hell wasn't going to tell anybody. And so, you know, we got together and we started working with this. And about 
about that time, and, and we the, the first year or two, I think we we actually met here in the desert. About that time, Miles had acquired uh, on site, and we so we moved it to Cumberland Furnace, Tennessee. Maybe besides Miles and Lizzie, nobody knew where in the hell Cumberland Furnace. <laughs> I did, but I know this is that we showed up there as a group of men prepared to begin to do our work. To do our work. And to drill down in there and look at what shaped, what formative experiences shaped the person I am today and shaped the person I was. You know, 2003, 2004, whenever it was. I, you know, I, I wish we would have kept a historical record. But I know that, that in that moment, that first session, that, that first experience on site, it started to change my life. <coughs> because I, I was in a position to begin to look at how I became and how I was shaped to become who I was. And I started that journey to becoming an effective leader. And I was, had already made the decision that it was time for me to, to move on from the Betty Ford Center. And, I, and I, I remember having a conversation with Maria, my wife, and I said, I will always know when it's time to go. And I came home one day and I said, it's time to go. And I just knew it. I knew it intuitively. God speaks to me through an intuitive thought, inspiration, and decision. We know that. And I had all of that coming at me in spades. And about this time, um, I get a call, and my oldest daughter had worked for Paul for a period of time, and Paul calls me and says, hey, I understand you maybe think about leaving the Betty Ford Center. If in fact that's true, can we talk? And, and, um, and I said, I don't think it might have been flippant. I, don't, I said, about what? What are we going to talk about? And, and, and so I went to Orange County, and I met with Paul, and, and fast forward to this moment. But I remember a conversation that we had early on. I said, Paul, here's the deal. Here's the deal. I have one non-negotiable. We will be healthy from the top down. We will be healthy from the top down. And as the 12 and 12 talks about, the spiritual precedes the material. And, and I was talking to Paul uh, about some of the work I had already been engaged in, continuing to be engaged in at, at on-site, and, um, and he's not in agreement. And, and like he just said, he's not in agreement. He didn't have a freaking clue what I was talking about. <laughs> not a clue. And he's right about that experience at my house, you know. And, and, you know, I'm not a technology guy. I think the only thing that scares me more than technology are these open chairs behind me. <laughs> and I'm sitting here, I'm looking for the box of, uh, box of props that Miles has in every room in the office. Go and pick something out. No, thank you. Or uh, put that chain away. I've already had that around my neck. You know. So, but we started to do this work, you know, and, and for me, it was extremely enlightening, but equally painful. And um, and as we continued to do this work, and, 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 and as so many of us, you know, and, and I probably should have had Paul put up there a disclosure. Um, we at Northbound love our relationship with OnSite. I happen to believe that what OnSite does is absolutely miraculous work. And I know there are some people in here that, that are engaged with OnSite and do some work on your behalf. And, and it, it's changed my life, and I happen to believe it's changed the company I'm now with, and it's changed your kind of professional life. About forty percent of our workforce has been through on-site, and uh, but here's really what I want to tell you: is that 
You know, Brene Brown, in her book, Daring Greatly, says, in no uncertain terms, we are hardwired for connection. You know, we are hardwired for connection. And I think I knew that, but I think the fact that I have continued to carry so much of my early childhood experience that I really couldn't connect with you. you know, I could connect with you here. I had a hard time connecting with you here. And what I now know about leadership is that it is a heart job first. It's this first. It's this second. And you know, when I started to really being able to admit the fact that I was fear driven and that I was full of shame, and that I, you know, I'm in a leadership position, but I hate conflict. I'm conflict avoidant. <laughs> Remember the first time I told Paul that? <laughs> In as a CEO. <laughs> so, but that's what you need to know about. And if we can begin to show up, as Brene Brown talked about, radically vulnerable. And if I am prepared to tell you the truth. Then we have opened up a whole new avenue in which to dialogue <coughs> and connect and lead. And what I saw Lucy do, and I, and I will tell you, and, and what I saw Paul do, you know, and, uh, this is, when I stand here and talk, you need to know that this is totally out of character for me. I am an off the chart introvert. <laughs> I guarantee you, I will leave here and go home and go to bed. <laughs> is, is that this takes so much of my energy to do this. And my wife says, and she knows that about me, and she said, why do you keep agreeing to me? <laughs> and I think the only thing I can think of today is that I feel so passionate about this topic. You know, I believe that we are called to this work. I believe we're called to this work. You know, and you know, when Lizzie was up here, and and you know, your willingness to show emotion, share your emotion with us, you know, early on in in, in Brene Brown's book, uh, Daring Greatly. She, she actually uh, has taken a very small excerpt from a, from a speech, from a talk that Theodore Roosevelt gave at the Sorbonne in Paris in April of 1910. And he had already left the presidency at that point. He left the presidency in, in, in uh, 1909. And the title of the speech was Citizenship in a Republic. And it was well over an hour in length. And it was about maybe 35 to 40 pages, the entire speech. But what has been really known most about that is what we now know is titled The Man in the Arena. And frankly, that's what we saw Lucy and Paul do. They stepped into the arena, you know, uh, because that's what we're called to do. And, and, and here, here is that excerpt. It says, it's not the critic who counts. Not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena. 
whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually do the deeds? Who knows the great devotions? Who spends himself in a worthy cause? And at best, in the end, knows the value of high achievement? And at worst, if he fails, at least he fails by daring greatly. So as to never be counted among those bold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. I know a lot of people in this room, and I've known a lot of you for a long time. We spend ourselves in a worthy cause. This work is a worthy cause. And as such, if you believe that, as Lizzie and Paul and Miles and I and a bunch of other people here believe that, if you believe this is a worthy cause, then I think we're compelled to show up more authentically. I think that we are called now to show up more in power and courageous and compassionate. And we can now begin to hold ourselves more accountable because we will absolutely be more authentic. And that's the nature of this work. And this was Lizzie's arena 30 minutes ago. I think we all need to get into the arena. Paul's right, there's a lot of crazy shit that's going on in this industry, you know? And I think collectively, if we can show up with one voice as effective leaders in the arena, doing our work, that's a pretty powerful approach to begin to counteract some of the stuff, you know? Yeah, and, 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 and if I have a question to call, that's it. You know, this work that, that, that I have committed to continue to do is about connection. I need to be connected. When I am in fear, I disconnect quicker than anybody I know. I absolutely, my brain somehow begins to short circuit. It's true. I know it's true because I learned about it in on site. Whatever they say on site, it's true. <laughs> and you, can, you can take it to the bank. But it really was, it was amazing when I heard Ted talk about the trap door. And I thought, hell, that's what I do. I get in fear inducing situations. And it's almost like I begin to hyperventilate and panic. And I just know, because my experience was as a little kid, something bad was about ready to happen. And that was it. And I just shut down. And the only thing I can think of, I got to get out. And I did that for a long time. I got out. I kept my exits open. I remember the first time it made sense, you know, why do I squirrel away a little cash on the side? Because I want to have an escape route, you know? And why do I do this an exit? Keeping these exits. The fact that I'm now doing this work has allowed me to close the exit and stay connected, stay committed, stay vulnerable. I gotta share this story, and I, I, I have no idea what time it is. <laughs> Miles is saying, I wish the hell you'd get off the stage, I can get up here for my thing. I've <laughs> been doing this work now with Miles and Derek and, and others for, I don't know, 10 or 12 years. And, and a couple years ago, I'm down in Nashville with my youngest daughter, 
and she's the apple that didn't fall far from the tree, and she recently celebrated seven years of sobriety. She's the mother of her grandson, and she's an amazing young woman. But she looked at me and she said, Dad, why do you keep going to onset? Why do you keep doing it? And I shared with her, well, you know, this was my experience uh, as a little boy, and, and, and this is what happened to me, and, and this is the trauma and the abuse, and talking about all of that. Now, you got to know that I met my wife in sobriety. We've been married almost 38 years. She has never seen me drink. My kids, my three daughters were born to me in sobriety. They were raised in, quote, a relatively sober home, stable home, um, some periods of being stupid and crazy, but for the most part, it's pretty good. And I was explaining this to Kate, what my experience was as a little kid and growing up in my house, and she said, Dad, that's exactly how I felt. <laughs> and you could have just knocked me off the chair. And I looked at her and think, really? And she looked at me and she said, I want you to call Miles, <clears throat> and I did. And she said, I want you and I to go, and you and I to work. Well, that's here to help. <laughs> but that's what we did. And so, uh, about a month later, I went back to Nashville. We go to on-site. We walk into this little room, and uh, Linda O was sitting in there, <laughs> and she uh, breaks out into this huge grin, runs over and hugs her, and says, "Dad, this is Linda. She did my LCP." And I'm thinking, "I'm screwed." <laughs> <laughs> and you know what I did? I just sat and I listened, and we did our work as a father and daughter. And what I learned because of that experience, was how, how I had diminished her spirit. Silver dot. How I had diminished that little girl's spirit. We have a wonderful relationship. As a result of our work, mine and hers. You know? So, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn this over to Miles, who's one of my great friends. And, and but I will tell you this. Um, we are hardwired for connection. And we need each other today in this business more than we've ever needed each other. We really do. And, and you know, I would ask us to take a look inside introspectively and, and ask ourselves, what is it that I can do today? One thing, two things, three things. What can I engage in that will really help me move to a more authentic leader? You know. I am honored to be here tonight. I'm honored to be part of this. I love what we do. I think we work in an amazing industry. We, in fact, change lives. And um, that's it for me. Thank you. One of the longest journeys we take is the 18 inches from here to here. And one of the hardest places we take it is in our field, helping professionals as a cohort we rank below average on the empathy scale. Did you know that? So at, you would think, those of us who are passionate about helping people, we would have high empathy. We rank below average. Why? It's a two-way street. We are really good at looking in the microscope at other people's pain. And we are really bad at picking up the mirror and looking at our own. So you want to know what leadership it's about? It's about putting down the microscope and picking up the mirror, and it's the hardest thing thing we'll do as a community. Because we are wired and taught and trained and educated to do it differently. It doesn't matter if you're a therapist or if you're a leader. It's just... So we're going to practice. Here's a little EQ quiz. We are all incredibly gifted and talented human doings. And I am one who has spent a lot of my career over-identifying with what I do. So you take that away up until the last few years, I couldn't tell you much. I had a script because I knew I needed to because I help people deal with that stuff. But the truth was I was terrified. 
I was terrified to commit in a relationship. Everything I wanted at the top of my priority list was where I spent the least amount of time. And I was all in the name of good, self-worth, self-help, boom. And I don't think I'm alone in that. So who are we? And do we take time as a community to get to know each other? So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Take your work hat off. So I've just stripped you of your professional identity. And I'd like you to find somebody you don't know. You might be, hopefully it's right beside you because it's a tight room. We won't have to move around a lot. <laughs> so maybe in front or behind you if you're sitting by your... And just find one person and connect. Share something about yourself as a human being. Nothing about what you do. And I want about 30 seconds each way, and then I'll keep time, and then I'll let you know. You ready? Go, people. All right, so here's what I want you to do. This is where it gets kind of uncomfortable and kind of weird, and just we're going to do it anyway because it's late. So I want you to turn around and put your back to the person that you just talked to. We you come up? Yeah. Yeah, it's getting warmer. All right, so you got that? Now I want you to do this. Everybody see me? So go ahead and lock on. Now here's, here's, here's exercise two. I want you to find someone new, not the person that you're with, and do the same exercise. Go. So what was that like? All right, let me get everybody's attention again. So we got a couple of people. What was it? I heard chaotic. What else? What's that? Weird. Awkward. Fun. Hot. Anybody feel frustrated? A few. Yeah. Yeah, it felt chaotic. It was not clear. I'm not sure what was going on behind me. There was a lot of wriggling and moving around, <laughs> and screaming, and all sorts of things. It got a little excited. It got a little excited. <laughs> So, so here's the thing. This is what we drag into leadership. We drag the unsaid, the unspoken, the unexplored, and whether you think you bring it or not, we bring it. It doesn't matter how much work you've done, I still bring it. We bring this into leadership. We bring this into the workplace. We bring lack of clarity. We bring baggage. We bring transference. We bring crazy duality. And we never get permission to talk about it. So what if you got permission to talk about it? What if tonight somebody held up a big permission slip and said, you get to go back into your organizations, you can start right here with these people, and say, these are the things I either struggle with, or maybe somebody told me I did and I didn't know I did. But you do. We do. What would a, so you just saw somebody who... I highly respect. He's one of those guys that could win all the awards for doing what you do in addiction treatment. He's run one of the biggest brands for a long time, and he sat up here and told you, this is where I've felt as a father. This is where I've felt as a leader. This is where I've felt in my recovery. Question, head nod, did you trust him more or less? More. It is counterintuitive to think as leaders we can walk into situations and take the journey and be human beings. I grew up, and every table that I sat around was like that. It was chaos. It was lack of clarity. I never had clear direction. The instructions were off. I knew something was off. And so when that happens for me, I do an emotional body scan, and if we had time, we would teach you all how to raise your EQ. Here's what's cool about EQ. You can raise it. And you want to know the most effective tool that will make you a leader, especially in the change profession, is raising your EQ. Your, your IQ, you're born with it, it's what you got. Sorry. You're, you're, I wasn't looking at you. <laughs> Sorry. 
<laughs> he was back there, he's like, what? <laughs> Our EQ we can raise when we take the risk um, to take a look. The single most important and effective thing that we have done in our culture is embraced our mess. The reason you saw me pause when, when Lizzie brought me up, and I did not know you were going to bring me up, that was not scripted, was because I wanted to do what we do 90% of the time in the workplace, which is perform. Because God forbid you would see me respond in a really demeaning, truthful way and me be able to rebound for that. Or you be able to trust me. And it's not about how we, it's not about how we respond, react. It's what we do with it. What do we do after that? Because that was real. That's what happened. I'm scared of conflict. I'm codependent. That's part of my recovery story. So when I saw an underperformer who's emotionally connected and who I look up to and honor, I was scared to death I'd hurt her feelings. She wanted the truth, and I gave her passive aggressive. She recognized that maybe before I did, but guess what we had the opportunity to do? A day later, and it used to would have been two years later if we ever did it at all, is we got to redo, we got to clean it up. I got to sit in front of you and say, this is what was coming up for me, I was hooked. Here's what I wanted to say, I wish I'd have been more direct with you, and I'm sorry. Do you ever do that? Is that common for you all in the workplace? Is it good? So the couple said no. Would somebody be willing to come up? I want to do one more thing. So it, it got really hot in here, didn't it? Yeah, so what's that? So hot, yeah. We're going to... Uh, we're going to try to uh, finish up a little early so we don't burn up. Yeah, come on. So if you would be willing to just stand right here. <laughs> and uh, this is something that I have done to show the change process, to show how resistance works. And I want to show you tonight through a leadership lens and how I feel it connects to the message that we're talking about. So we're going to say that you have shown up to me, shown up uh, with a problem. You're struggling, you're stuck, you've got a problem. And uh, I am, you know, I'm, I'm a professional, I'm your leader, I can help you. And, and you could say, you can put therapist here, whatever you want to put. I'm the therapist, I'm the leader, I've got the answer. There are these things called stages of change. Does everybody know what they are? It's an educated audience. It's pretty cool. I won't get into them other than there's six and in some circles seven. Every time we show up in the workplace or personally seeking help, we're at a two. And a two is pre-contemplative. Pre-contemplative, you can make up what that means. It's, I know I need help, but I'm not really sure I trust uh, the person I'm asking or I trust myself that I can be clear about what I need. So I'm not real sure about it, but I know I need it. So that's where we are. You've shown up here. 90% of the time, us as the change agents, we're at a six, which is action. So there's four stages in between us. This is the gap in which every person that walks into your line of sight exists, whether you know it or not. They're in pre-contemplative, you're in action. So what do we do with this gap? I mean, look at, look at this. this it's, the solution's right here. And I, I mean, if you just come over here, it's incredible. Oh, come on. It's awesome. Yeah, come on. I mean, so there it is. Good night, y'all. <laughs> so how's it feel over here? A little bit closer to you. And so when you, when you came over, um, got a lot of... Anal uh, analytics in here, and so we read your body language. So you came over, you gave us a little laugh. You said, <laughs> say more about the laugh. Well, you're a little bit smaller than me, so I don't know. I was just giggling about that. <laughs> <laughs> that 
<laughs> Sorry. It's true. Sorry. So, here's what we know about what just happened. When we ask people to do something and it's our idea and not theirs, they will do it most of the time, especially those we lead and those we treat. We call that compliance. Compliance is the number one form of resistance. Compliance and leadership is your enemy, but it makes us as leaders feel really good because I got you where I wanted you to go. So here's what we know is that compliance does not create long-term sustainable change. Basically, you will be over here because of me, and ultimately you'll get to a place where you'll resent that you made this walk. So head on back. That's the go-to. For those of us that are change agents and leaders, that's the go-to. How can I convince you to come from here to here? Well, let me show you how good this looks. And that didn't work. And so usually you're going to bounce back. So I want to tell you one more time, though, how incredible this is. I mean, look, look at it. And if you, if you get, a, like, a closer look at it and just kind of fix your eyes on it, it's... Uh... <laughs> so how was that? <laughs> well, you're still small. I mean, you pushed me, so I swear. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It was, um, it was, I was trying to be compliant. <laughs> so what did it feel like to be pushed? I'm, I'm not, I'm feeling really comfortable, so that, that was okay. But that's because I'm very Thank you. Thank you for saying that. A push for us feels comfortable. So you know, one of the fastest ways we can get people to comply is confront them. And we have such high shame, those of us that come th through a shame lens, that the fastest way we can shut up confrontation is to comply with it. There is all kinds of, re we were, our industry was built from a confrontation model. That's all we knew in the 50s. And now there's all kinds of research coming out in the last 20 years that say confrontation is the absolute worst tool you could use to create sustainable change. There is a time for confrontation, and that's when you're standing on a bridge and I need to grab you by the shirt and pull you down. But there's also another time where what we know is you're gonna go back, so head on back. And I'm gonna speed it up, because there's a thousand ways I'm gonna to try to get you to come over here and engage in the change process. I'm gonna push you, I'm gonna introduce you, how you doing, man? And I'm going to do that, and none of it will stick. None of it will stick. Our job as guides, as leaders, as professionals, tell me about that. Good job. You're good. Yeah. yeah. Our job is not to push or pull people where we think they need to go. Our job is to join them. And that's the hardest journey that we take, is walking back and joining people in their pain. Why is that hard? Say that again. We don't want to feel it. Don't want to feel it. More about that. Why is that hard? Bam. Bam. The hardest journey I take every day when I get out of bed and walk to work is when I'm sitting back there and pre-contemplated, and I am every five minutes and so are you, I've got this bully sitting over here in action that says, you dumbass. You've got these tools, you know this, you've done this a thousand times, come on. This is how we dialogue with ourselves. The journey that Mike talked about and the journey that Paul and Lizzie talked about and that some of you have been on goes beyond this identity that we've created, which is our recovery. Who are you without that? Do you have any language without that? All those are tools and they're important tools. They are not meant to identify and define you for the rest of your life. That's my opinion. And I think when we get over-identified and attached to anything, we are searching for disorganized attachment that we grew up with. Secure attachment starts with making this journey, and it's a hard journey, guys, making this journey back here and joining up with ourselves. 
When you make that journey and you join up with yourselves, that is the only way you can effectively cross back and join up with anybody else. And I did that kicking and screaming, and I fought, and I didn't know how to do it. And I turned into my dad, and I was sleeping 18 hours on day. I was uh, working 18 hours a day sleeping on the couch when I was early in my career, and I was calling guys like Jim and like Mike and my mentors, and I was saying, what do I do? What do I do? I didn't ask them that. I said, well, how do I handle this HR issue? Remember that? How do I handle this? How do I fire this person? How do I hire this person? How do I do this? And what did I get? I got a lot of logic. What I meant to say was, I can't hold a relationship. I'm exhausted. I've turned into what I despise. I'm a workaholic. And I am landed in a profession that I love that I see no way forward. And that is what all of us, young, old, it is our biggest asset and our biggest obstacle. And that's how we arrive in this field. Whether you come through your own broken lens of recovery or whether you showed up with a passion for helping people and then you figured out you've got some stuff. <laughs> and guess what? That's the gift is knowing we've got stuff, but what the heck do we do about it? So I sat there as this young guy in recovery, this young leader, and I had these great people who've been doing this for 30, 40 years, and, and they could tell me what to do. They had the book, the playbook on what to do. But I didn't know how to ask, who am I? So I had to make a decision at that time. I can either be where the guys that I looked up to are, stand on podiums and probably win awards and get recognized for all that I've accomplished in this field in 30 years, or I can get married, I can have a family, and I can have a life. But no evidence supported it that the two could coexist in our industry. Because everybody I was talking to that was 20, 30 years in, and this is not judgment, it's just truth, estranged from adult kids, married multiple times. I was looking at this picture and this imprint thinking, I'm screwed. And all it took was for somebody like Mike to look at me and said, this is where I've been getting it wrong. Boom, I got this huge permission slip as a young leader. You want to know how to do succession and create a next generation of healthy leaders? Don't tell them what's, what's, what's great about you and what's your program. Don't open up the hood and show them how shiny it is. Open up your heart and tell them how hard this profession can be. That's not what's wrong with you. It's what's right with you. That's not what's wrong with us. It's what's right with us. We are people who are made to take this journey uniquely and divinely appointed to walk back, but we do not give ourselves permission in our organizations and in our cultures to be messy and broken. We don't get a chance to get it wrong. I don't get a chance to sit in front of a bunch of colleagues and say, I screwed up with Lizzie in that leadership moment. And I've done worse. I'm the guy that, you know, I'll get up and, and I used to get up and talk about the solution, the solution, the solution, the solution, and I'd never leave you with any insight that I was a mess. I want to know your mess, and I want you to know mine. I have learned and am learning that healthy organizations don't look perfect. Those of you that have been affiliated and friends and, and work and, and at ours, I tout healthy culture and organizational health, and I say it is the biggest and most contributing factor to the outcomes we provide, and I, I believe it, and I don't think we talk about it. I think we look at all these factors that, that I'm grateful for organizations like SAMHSA. They'll tell us vocational and relational and community. Nobody says, is the health of the organization mirroring and modeling what we're asking people to do? It doesn't matter if you've got 10 beds, an IOP, or if you're a one-person shop. Are you mirroring and modeling what you're asking people to do? Are you engaging in the change process? Are you allowing yourself to be seen and to feel messy? Because that's who we are. We are the brave and brokenhearted, as my friend Brene would say. And I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. The last two or three years, I've been blessed to, to go speak in some other industries and bring some of the message beneath the message beneath the message is buried under this beautiful thing that we do, which is love and grace. And all the stigma that we complain about out there in the world around people getting into therapy and recovery, I think we create most of it because we box in our information. And I think it's time we break down the walls of that box, and the only, thing, only way we do that is to stop thing, saying things and start doing things. Stop talking about it in circles and go out there and be who you are. People are drawn to it. I walk into audiences that I'm judging before I step on the stage. 
I'm like, I know you people. And when I'm, <laughs> the guy back there laughed and nodded, thank you. <laughs> He's like, me too, I think. Um, and they're starving for it. But what I know at the end of the day is no matter how far I go from you, when I come back here, it's home. And that's what I want for all of us. What we did should be impossible. What Lizzie and the women's groups are doing should be impossible. Because there's all kinds of duality. We're competitors. We're friends. Everything in the text says don't do that. Don't get together and disclose that. And it's been the single most important thing I've done in this field. It's absolutely transformed me as a human being, as a leader. You want to be a better leader, be a better human being. That's the bottom line. So would you guys come back up, all, all the... Um, Paul, Paul's right, and I'm, we, we, uh, we probably did drive you crazy because you called. It's like, man, have we got any structure to this thing? And um, <laughs> if it weren't for it, but here's the thing is we were honored to be invited to, to be a part of this because we have, in disclosure, you know, the, none, all those plugs are just true stories. We're not up here promoting anything other than to say this is as real as we want to be. And we were supposed to sit up here as a panel and talk to you about 101 leadership and authenticity. And I've never been to a panel I really liked. <laughs> Shit. I didn't mean to say that because some of you have been on panels I've watched. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and so we decided to do something different. Let's just be real because here's what we know. It's, it's, we're beyond the era where people take the information that we work hard to create and use it better than we do advertising community. They use our information way better than we do. You know why? Because they don't sit up here and spend 20 hours studying what they do and talk about how much they know. They bypass that part of the brain and go right into the part of the brain that changes behavior. And so if we can walk away from this thing, information alone doesn't create sustained change. Heart does. So if we can walk away from this thing with a shift in who we are and how we're feeling, we got a way better chance than going back and being better human beings and better leaders. So if you would do this, um, did y'all want to say anything before we close? No. <laughs> we know better than the you do. No. <laughs> so if you would, grab, grab, a, grab a shoulder next to you. And on three, just say, well done. One, two, three. Well done. No, seriously, well done, guys. Well done. <laughs>